Hi, and welcome back to Scotty's Tech.info. I'm Scotty with my co-host Cletus. The last time you were on an airplane, did you notice that there were these little antenna-like things on the back of the wings? Um, there were actually like five, six, seven of them. Well, what the heck are those things for? Now, the answer to this question is actually pretty darn cool. So, in order to explain what they're there for, we begin with a balloon and a piece of wool. <laughs> So you have your balloon, you have your piece of wool. And we know from, you know, the time we're little kids, you take the balloon and the piece of wool and you put them together. And if you rub them together and move the wool up and down, what ends up happening is electrons actually move from the piece of wool to the surface of the balloon. And what we end up with is a negatively charged balloon and a relatively positively charged piece of wool. And then, of course, if you take the balloon and put it near your hair, your hair sticks to the balloon. And, of course, we all know this is just static electricity, right? Simple. Ah. We also know that if you're walking, uh, say, along a carpet uh, in your stocking feet, uh, the same thing happens. You become electrically charged. The wool actually gives up electrons, and the electrons go onto uh, your body. Uh, generally on the surface of your body, and then, let's say, you decide to reach out and touch the grounded screw of, say, an old-fashioned light switch, or maybe you touch a doorknob, any, you know, grounded metal. Well, what happens? Bzzzt, you get zapped, because the electrons, the charge that built up on your fingertip, or on your body, it goes through your fingertip and down to the ground, through the screw on the light switch, through the doorknob, whatever, but essentially that charge is discharged from your body to the light switch or doorknob or whatever. So again, it's just static electricity. Well, okay, uh, but cling wrap. Guess what makes cling wrap cling to a glass bowl? Well, from sciencefocus.com we read, When you unroll the cling film, some of the electrons on the surface of one layer get pulled away onto the adjacent layer. This creates patches of positive and negative electrostatic charge. Because cling film is a good insulator, uh, that's important, this charge persists for quite a while. When you wrap the cling film around itself or another insulator, like glass, the electrostatic charge induces an opposite charge in the other surface, and the two stick together. Now, obviously this whole static electricity thing is pretty darn cool, because, um, you know, you have power lines running from your power company, right? They're made of things like copper and aluminum. Why? Because there we're talking about current electricity. You know, the theory is, the generally accepted theory is that you have, you know, a bunch of, a whole string of copper atoms and you apply a voltage and the, you know, the electrons move along, get exchanged between the, the, the different, you know, copper molecules, blah, 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 whatever, right? Copper atoms, you know, great. So static electricity is actually fascinating because we're talking about taking two insulators and rubbing them together and they become electrically charged. Uh, you wouldn't have power lines made of rubber balloons or wool carpet because that would be ridiculous. So um, there's a generally accepted theory. Now the, the most fascinating thing about this is that actually scientists are not quite sure why static electricity works. So I'll give you the current theory. The current theory is that when you have a balloon and a piece of wool, say, and you rub them together, now the surface of the wool fibers may be a little shaggy, but the surface of the rubber balloon is very smooth. But if you zoom in really close, what you have is kind of these rough surfaces. And the theory is, more or less, that when you rub those two surfaces together, you're actually compressing at a molecular level the, the molecules of the balloon and the molecules of the wool fibers in the carpet. And that, that compression is causing kind of like a voltage gradient, which then makes the insulators give up or receive electrons, and voila, they become electrically charged. Right, that's actually kind of crazy. In fact, that's actually the nuttiest theory I've ever heard. But yet, that seems to be what's happening here. So, okay, well, whatever. So at this point, you're probably going, that's great, Scotty, but what in the heck does that have to do with those little antennas on the back of airplane wings? Right, so it turns out that they are not antennas, they are what, is, what are known as static dischargers. So what happens is, just like with the wool and 
your balloon and that kind of thing, you have an airplane and the airplane is traveling through the air. Now, sometimes the air is dry. Uh, sometimes the air is wet. Sometimes uh, you have, you have uh, dust, you have ice crystals, you have snow. And of course, your airplane is traveling through the air at a rather high velocity. And so you have friction between the aircraft skin, the, the usually aluminum alloy skin of the aircraft, and the air, dust, rain, snow, sleet, whatever. And what ends up happening is it's kind of like rubbing your piece of wool against your balloon. A static charge builds up on the airplane. At which point you might go, uh-oh, this is not necessarily a good thing because if you don't discharge that static somehow, what ends up happening is the charge builds up and builds up and builds up, kind of like on your balloon or, or on your finger when you're snuffling your feet along the carpet. And when you touch something, uh, you ground all that charge and bzzz, you get a zap. Well, with an airplane, a really, really, really big charge can build up. And what will eventually happen is you have like little actual antennas on the airplane or the sharp edge of like the wingtip or the tail fin. And you'll actually get arcing and corona discharge and uh, rather unpleasant zaps. Now, technically, this doesn't really pose any real threat to the aircraft itself, but it does actually generate a whole lot of radio frequency noise up to like the one gigahertz spectrum, and that can interfere with communications and navigation equipment and that sort of thing. So what you do when you're building an airplane is you actually put these little antenna things, these static dischargers, on the trailing edge of all these surfaces. And what that does is it allows the, the, build, the built up electrons that charge that's built up on the skin of the aircraft to be safely dissipated out essentially the rear of the aircraft. And the reason they're pointy like antennas is first of all, the, each little antenna actually has a resistance of like several megohms. And the idea there is that as the charge builds up on say the front of the airplane, you want it to all sort of go towards the back of the airplane. And of course, if it was just sort of like a direct short, with no resistance, you might get sharper discharges. So what they do is they put a resistance in each one of these static dischargers so that it's continuously and slowly discharging that charge buildup on the aircraft's hull, gently and effortlessly and safely into the air behind the aircraft. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that in order for this to work, uh, the shell of the aircraft needs to be essentially a Faraday cage. So uh, from my other video about, uh, you know, how to make a Faraday cage to, you know, prevent your cell phone from transmitting and receiving signals, we know that a Faraday cage is essentially a continuous shell of conductive material, usually metal. And if it's a continuous shell, then the inside of the Faraday cage, in this case, the cabin of the airplane, is essentially protected from all radio transmissions and, and electromagnetic craziness and all that sort of thing. Uh, so it's fascinating, actually, because it turns out that even the windows of airplanes uh, usually have a conductive layer because, as you know, with a Faraday cage, it has to be a continuous shell of metal, so you can't have a hole in the middle like glass is an insulator. That won't work. So they put, like, a conductive layer in, like, the windscreen of uh, the cockpit, for example. And, of course, that means all doors and hatches must be uh, sealed. If the air aircraft uses composite materials, there has to be a conductive layer uh, somewhere sandwiched in that composite layer and that uh, that conductive layer has to actually be joined to the rest of the metal parts of the aircraft. So you have to have a complete Faraday cage and then you have to have these little antenna-like things sticking off the back with a resistance and voila, your aircraft is protected from static discharge, no disruption to communications, no disruption to navigational equipment, everything is hunky-dory. Okay, so at this point you're going, uh, right, well, giant discharge, like, what about lightning? I mean, surely those little antennas in the back, if it's reducing static discharge, that should help protect the plane against lightning, right? Well, the official answer is no, it does not help protect the aircraft from a lightning strike. Now, this is particularly interesting because uh, actually lightning is a really, really big electrostatic discharge. Now, normally, airplane is flying. Um, what usually happens is, uh, generally speaking, kind of more the front of the airplane gets struck by lightning. And again, we have the, the aircraft is a Faraday cage, so the lightning passes harmlessly through the skin of the aircraft, usually exits like the bottom near the tail of, of the airplane, and bzzz, you're fine. And of course, if you're in the cabin, um, you'll probably notice nothing. Maybe the lights will flicker, maybe the radio communications will crackle a little bit. But if the engineers who designed the airplane did their jobs, well then, actually, 
you'll be fine. You won't even notice that your plane is hit by lightning. If it's repeatedly struck by lightning, then yes, uh, you may have some problems. And in fact, planes are checked for lightning damage like every time they land because things can actually break. But generally speaking, uh, if you're in an airplane that's struck by lightning, you won't even have any idea. Now, the way that this works is, okay, say here you have a thundercloud, right? Uh, now, the, the official explanation, scientific explanation, and I should note here that scientists are not entirely sure that this is how it works. This is kind of our current best theory. The theory is that inside a thundercloud, uh, below the thundercloud, you usually have an updraft. And that updraft will uh, freeze and lift upward tiny little ice crystals. From the top of the cloud, you have, uh, I, th I believe it's called graupel. Uh, never heard that word before, but it's basically kind of like larger, heavier clumps of snowy, slushy, sleety stuff. Um, hail, in any case, bigger clumps of essentially frozen water. So the, the, the bigger chunks descend from the top of the cloud and the smaller ice crystals are blown upward by an updraft. And it is the collision essentially between two types of frozen water it, that's that's your friction. That's your that's your static electricity friction, and that causes a separation of charge, so that the negative charge is carried downwards by the the snowy graupel chunks, and the positive charge is carried upwards by the ice crystals. And what you end up with is the top of a thundercloud is generally positively charged. The bottom of the thundercloud becomes negatively charged, and of course the ground is typically positively charged relative to the negative underside of the cloud. And eventually the charge builds up enough that you get bzzzt, a big lightning zap. And that is actually uh, the currently accepted theory as to how lightning is generated. Now, this is all kind of incredibly fascinating because obviously the Faraday cage protects against static discharges. It's also what protects the airplane against a lightning strike. And of course, the electrostatic buildup that occurs when the plane is flying through the air, it's due to rubbing together static electricity generation. And of course, a lightning discharge, again, is due to, the theory goes, rubbing ice crystals in the clouds, boom, you get an electrostatic buildup, you get a discharge, Bob's your uncle. Um, the fascinating thing is that this generally accepted theory of how static electricity is generated by two, rubbing two insulators together, that's kind of our best guess at the moment, but there's not general agreement. Some people think there may be other factors at work, uh, other principles, maybe something we haven't even discovered yet. And the same is true for how uh, thunderstorms generate lightning. That's kind of currently our best guess. So we go from a simple question of what are those little antenna things at the back of an airplane wing to uh, basically discovering some things about static electricity where uh, even our best and brightest minds are not entirely sure what's going on there. So who knew that simply sitting on an airplane looking out the window going, what the heck are those little things could lead to such a fascinating subject? Don't forget to click the like and subscribe buttons because that really helps me out. For more techie tips, see scottystech.info. And thanks for watching. See you next time.